for tonight, if you think it's fact, I want you to raise your right hand. If you think it's fiction, raise your left hand. And then when it comes up all together, we'll say fact or fiction. That will make it somewhat more exciting. All right. So here we go. You ready? Now I want you to go back memory lane. Uh, are you going to move there? No, you're not. Oh, you're not on. This is called a clicker. All right. This is a quiz. How many remember George Washington and Abraham Lincoln hanging in the classroom? Oh, you remember that, right? And you yep. right there, February 22nd was his birthday. February 12th was his birthday. And that's what the classroom looked like when many of us were in school. Yeah. Under, those are the 1950s. So what did we learn about the Civil War? What do we remember? A lot of people died. Yeah. What were the colors? Blue and gray, maybe. And then again, all we ever learned was we got rid of slavery, right? right? That's what the Civil War was about. And there were a lot of battles north against the south. They didn't much like each other. And pretty much that's all they still teach today. We know the names of the general. Who knows the name of the Union general? Yes, Bobby. Well, when? Which one? When? Grant. Right on. If I had a prize, I'd give it to you. Oh, well, but I don't. Anyway. Too cheap. Sorry, buddy. No cookies. But Grant. And who was the Southern general? Robert Lee. Lee. Robert E. Lee. In my checkered career, I have taught four Robert E. Lees. And one, Elise Lincoln and uh, a Michelle Lee. They number their kids. They're all Robert E. Lee, the first, second, third, fourth. I think I got to the seventh. But anyway, let's move on. This is a rumor. Civil War surgeons were butchered who hacked off limbs without <laughs> anesthesia. How many think that's fact? How many think it's fiction? It's fiction. Why? Because they used chloroform. Oh. And all that you heard was fiction. They were able to anesthetize them in the field. And so they can operate on them Give him a shot of whiskey. The surgery was pretty awkward. You know, you hack sawed off a leg or something. And if you go to Gettysburg, you can see where they piled the limbs. But that was fiction. Okay, here, after the Battle of Shiloh. Oh, there it is. I didn't hear you, you win the cookie. <laughs> after the Battle of Shiloh, injured so soldiers' wounds were glowing. How many think that's fact? No. Fiction. Gotcha. Oh. It was fact because these wounds, it was a photo habitus luminescence. It's a bacteria that healed, but it glows in the dark. And they couldn't figure out these guys are lying there and the wounds are lighting up. Wow. And they say, well, oh, you know what they thought was like, oh, my goodness, is God here or something? I don't know. All right. So that's a fact. Moving on. Did a woman become pregnant from a Civil War bullet? Fact. Fiction. Bingo. It's fiction. This guy made a career of saying that a woman became, how did she become pregnant with a bullet? You're ready. What she did. They said a soldier took a shot and it hit a man in the nether regions in his scrotum and it passed on through and landed in the woman's belly. Oh. Oh. And when the child was born, he was born with the very bullet in his scrotum. They, he wrote this up in the medical journal so somebody discovered it was fiction. That's the kind of stuff we're looking at tonight. Now, here's another one. Civil War generals on both sides were friends before and after the war. Fact. Fiction. It is, drumroll, a fact. This is the Aztec Club of 1847. We never talk about it. Because you see, that was the Mexican War, and we don't like to think about that war because 1849, the war went on. They were all in, that's how we got Texas and California. So Grant and Lee were good friends. Lee was an engineer blowing up things. Grant was his buddy. This is George McClellan, little opponent, Zach Taylor, here are the Confederates, and P.T. Beauregard, who we'll find out later. They were the veterans of the Mexican War. This organization still exists today with descendants. We also had, I love this group, and we'll talk about Daniel Sickles before. One-legged General Dan Sickles, he planned it. 
And you can see all the generals who met in the Society of the Army of Potomac. They met every year in New York. And Sickles invited everybody to his apartment to plan and drink and plan and drink more and drink more. And Sickles will talk about a little bit later. Now, the Union Army formed the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. My man there, Carl Schurz, the German-American, was the first GAR president in St. Louis. And these are all the heroes of the Republic. And that's the northern group. The southern group is Sons of the Confederacy. Now, back to fiction. Both sides at Gettysburg reunited and celebrated for 48 years after the battle. Fact. Fiction. There's a fact. This was original Pickett's charge. If you've ever, how many have been to Gettysburg? Oh, good. Or a field trip? I don't know. Gettysburg has a brand new museum, by the way, the uh, hospital museum, which is just awesome. And it's maybe we should take a field trip at $10. Sounds good. Yeah, sounds good to me. But Pickett's charge um, running up the hill to the stone wall. And years later, at the first reunion in the 1860s, 70s, early 70s, the old boys from Pickett's Charge ran, walked up the hill at this point and shook hands with the opponents and made peace, which is something they don't like to talk about. There, there's so much revision, revisionist history now that the stories are changing. And I like to go back and take a look at what really happened. These are at the monuments, which are all over. This is Crown, Indiana, and the, the, all the soldiers would gather at the monument at Gettysburg, which brings us to this. This is from Bruce. This is in Bruce's little wooden box that his relative, I think it's your wife's great-grandfather, I think, yeah, his name. And you look at the ribbon. There's the uh, monument to the 134th Regiment of New York Volunteers. And these guys collected them, and they must have meant something because this has been in your family since whatever. And then they would each get a medallion or a little a medal. Uh, and so thank you, Bruce. And we have a picture of Charles Wood, who was at a member of the GAR post number 198. He enrolled August 1862. He was a corporal, first sergeant, and mustered out. Now, the thing that's interesting, if you were in the volunteer army in the Civil War, your rank meant nothing after the war. So you could go from a major to a private in the regular army. What did that affect? Your pension. Now, Confederate soldiers never received a pension. Fact or fiction? They lost the war. What do you think? Fact? It's fiction. Well, we see why. This is... Um, my aunt by marriage, this is her grandfather over there, Seaborn Camp. The Camp brothers were from Georgia, the 11th Georgia Infantry, who were, and they went to every Gettysburg reunion they could find. This guy was known as the Colonel, and Colonel Camp. Actually, he was a sergeant, but since he was the only one left, he went by Colonel. And over there, Seaborn Camp, my aunt's grandfather, they lived on a Texas pension till 1936. Now, how did that happen? Well, it's interesting. He married an 18-year-old woman. Yeah, they all did. All the old boys married the younger women so they could keep the pension for life. So there you go. So it, And Seaborn Camp, I met his son, would you believe? I know him. And there were four brothers, and they went to every reunion except the fourth brother. He deserted in Petersburg and escaped to Arizona. But they all looked like, my cousin says, they looked like ZZ Top. If you remember that. Fact or fiction? Short hair and haircuts were required of soldiers. Remember the, the during the Vietnam War, the big hassle about long hair? Well, did Civil War soldiers um, have to have short hair? Fact or fiction? Fact. Fiction. It was fiction because look at these hairstyles. <laughs> uh, this guy, Captain Henry Hayes, probably had the longest mustache. And it comes down with his shoulders. General Albert Jenkins had the long beard, not to me confused with Longstreet or this other fellow with the big mustache. Now, if you look up here, look at Lincoln's do before he grew the beard. And then there's this fellow. Now, Ambrose Burnside in the upper left is known for sideburns today. That's where we get that. And you'll perhaps wonder why Anderson Cooper is there. 
See the man on his left? That's uh, General Judson Kilpatrick, and his grandson is Anderson Cooper. And Kilpatrick is from Newton, and he's known as Kill Cavalry because that's what he did. He had a reunion, by the way, up at his house there in Newton. They had more people at the reunion there living in the town of Newton. because that, So they were quite the group. Longstreet, by the way, ends up working for the government, the American government, as ambassador to Spain after the war. His wife is from um, down by Rutgers. Now, New York City wanted to secede from the Union because of Confederate money and the so-called shoddy uniform manufacturers. Do you think that's true? We have to get her a chair. So anyway, true fact, New York wanted to secede. How about fiction? Oh, boy. It is fact. Because New York City did not exist until 1898 because it was such a dump and city of sin with prostitution, homeless immigrants. Does sound familiar? Anyway, uh, also they imported 300 Irishmen, the Brooks Brothers, to make uniforms for the Confederacy as well as the Union. And that's where we get the word shoddy because they used bum cloth and cardboard soles. As a result, your uniform dissolved in the rain, which was not a good thing, and you had to pay for it. So this fellow here, the mayor, decided that they would form a free city of Tri-Insula, three islands, in Manhattan, Long Island, and Staten Island. Uh, it didn't happen. Why? Because all the Confederate money was in Wall Street, New York. And that's where all the money was. So let's get out of here, because we're going to lose money. And after all the Confederate uniforms, they I don't know why shoddy uniforms pass, but if you ever look at some of the Civil War pictures, you will see men with bare feet. And they will say, oh, that's a Confederate soldier. who couldn't afford shoes. No, it was some poor guy, my feet are clean, whose boots dissolved, grabbing the first pair of boots off the dead guy. So here we go. Confederate uniforms were movie stars, fact or fiction. It is a fact, fiction. Body's good. It's a fact. Why? because they were used in Gone with the Wind. Okay. The uniforms in Gone with the Wind are real. They were made by, there were 30,000 of them, made by Confederate wives who decided that um, they'd make the uniforms to save money, and they were put in a warehouse. And when this movie came up, they discovered that they could use them. So they put them on Leslie Howard up there, and they made by the women in the South. Here's the problem. You see the one down there? That's probably phony because they burned them all after the war. So we have no idea after the movie. So we have no idea what these um, uniforms look like. And if you see one online, $5,000 Confederate Union, it's probably fake. All right. Move along. Stay with me. The youngest union officer was 14 years old. Fact or fiction? Fact, Bobby? Fact. How about fiction? You think, okay, well, it actually is fiction because he was nine years old. <laughs> Most people don't know he was a nine-year-old drummer boy who was so brave, he was made a sergeant at age nine. He served in the Army until 1915 as the rank of Brigadier General in the Quartermaster Corps. He was the last veteran on duty in the United States, and he was a drummer boy. By the way, he ran away from home, John Lincoln Clem ran away from his daddy. He lived a good number of years. Uh, he served as the drummer boy, and he was very famous. Pictures all over the place. John, and there's a picture, Johnny Clem. Now, the fiction. Before the Guinness World, this is cool. The Before the Guinness Book of World Records, no Civil War notables, such as the biggest, tallest, or shortest, were kept. This gentleman here, 1,400-pound John Brown Minnick, is supposed to be the heaviest man in the world. Sultan Curzon is eight foot two, the tallest man in the world. And of course, the other fellow at 21.5 inches is the shortest man in the world. Let's take a look at Civil War. How tall were the records kept? Yes or no? Fact or fiction? Mm -hmm. Bobby says fact. He's right. Look at this. There they were. The tallest one is Martin Bates, seven foot nine, who married Anna Swan. He was a captain uh, in. 
in the Confederacy, she's seven foot 11. I have no idea what the children look like. And this fellow here, Captain Henry Clay Thurston, was hired by uh, P.T. Barnum as the tallest man in the world at seven foot, I don't know how tall he was, uh, seven foot five, I think, or seven and a half feet tall. And this fellow here, we have no picture of him. He was Samuel Riddleberger. He died in Nashville. He had weighed as much as 548 pounds. I don't know if he ever had a horse. And at the time of his death, he weighed 478 pounds. His coffin was the largest one ever made in Nashville. Now, this guy's unit, Captain David Van Buskirk, he was captured near Winchester, Virginia, and sent to Libby Prison, which is in Richmond. And they take him out of prison regularly and parade him through the town because you see the big guy. Oh, look how big he is, which was often good for him. And he let him out at night to be featured in a circus-like freak show in downtown Richmond. And he survived the war, which is wonderful. Now, what about the generals? If you look at the picture on the left. That's at Antietam. So the tall gentleman with the high hat is Lincoln. This is a Matthew Brady picture, uh, kind of not taken too legally. You see the chair there? Because General McClellan, Little Mac, five foot seven, said, I will not be photographed with Lincoln unless he's sitting down. Of course, fighting Joe Hooker, five foot two, and little Phil Sheridan, five foot two. Lincoln was six four to six five. Can you imagine that? Of course, the funny thing is, do you all see the word Hooker there? Do you associate that with anything else? <laughs> what what word do we get from Hooker? Hookers, right? Wonder why. <laughs> Little Joe had a propensity for bringing ladies of the evening into the tent. And somebody would say, who are those women? And somebody else would say, well, those are hookers. And that's where it comes from. And he he was um, not a good general. At Chancellorsville, he screwed up terribly. He said Lee was retreating. And somebody said, but general, that's to the north. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. It was 18,000 confederate troops flanking him then he got hit with a falling piece of wood and but said he never remembered it for the rest of the war mcclellan kept waiting so lincoln fired him little phil was uh by the way little phil Sheridan was later on put in charge of native americans after the civil war he's the one who said the only good indian is a dead indian all right here we go. They were local heroes led by General Mother McAllister and the boy soldiers immortalized in a stained glass window. Fact or fiction? Fact? Fiction? He cheated because he knows the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> All right. This, this is a stained glass Tiffany window in Tennessee. There is a chapel in Tennessee where each unit from the Confederacy commissioned Tiffany to do this is the first Alabama, but that's not the one I'm talking about. <laughs> this is Mother McAllister. I want to tell you his story. If you go to Belvedere, he is from Warren County. You go to Belvedere, that's his graveyard with his uh, gravestone, with his picture on the front of it. It's about a story pie. He had no ego. <clears throat> if you go to Oxford, which is up the road here, he built the railroad tunnel. He was an engineer, but when he raised a troop, and they were from all over, including Hackettstown and uh, Dover and that, he was a Christian, born-again Christian, and a teetotaler. He did not believe that anyone should drink at all. He's got about 50 Irishmen out of Dover. They didn't sit well. Well, anyway, as he gets to Gettysburg, and we'll see that in a minute, half of the unit was killed at Gettysburg. There were 90 came from Dover and Randolph and seven went up the hill. Why? Because General Dan Sickles got lost. He's on the Emmitsburg Pike. The story you learn in school is <clears throat> that he arrived late and repositioned the troops. Well, here's the Klingle farmhouse. This is the Emmitsburg Pike today. You see the blue cross is? The farmhouse was filled with Confederate snipers. On his left flank, he had the Confederate division between him and the Peach Orchard, and coming out of his McClaw's division. The boys trying to run up the hill, and um, now we'll see about Private Searing from Dover and Searing Street, who bent over to check his pants. Huh. And when he stood back up, the guy behind him was there. 
and all of them are unknown because they they took a lot of artillery. Uh, this is Hackettstown's own. This guy at 125 Main Street in Hackettstown owned a general store. This is Major Thomas Holsey, who was a um, station master in Dover. He was on the town council. The letter on the left, which I got from his great-granddaughter, was written by a fellow soldier because he was captured at Andersonville and suffered pretty much through that. He returned to duty, worked as a station master in Dover, but then he opened a store at 127 Main Street and moved to Missouri. Why? I don't know. But when he came back, he's buried in Orchard Street in Dover. What time is it? Uh, it is now 5.07. You good? Thank you. Okay. So he um, he opened the store up here, moved to Missouri, and when his body came home, all the buttons and the sword were missing. And he's buried in Orchard Street in Dover. All right. This is the stained glass window, which is in Phillipsburg. It's in the Presbyterian Church in Phillipsburg. It's been restored. The county gave $90,000 to redo it. And because of the chaplain from Dover, E. Clark Klein, of the 11th New Jersey, probably the bloodiest losses that you could imagine of all those boys being killed. Now, Mother McAllister, the first thing he did when he arrived in the camp is he built a chapel. And then he gave out little broadsides so the boys could have a prayer service. Then he gave out the liquor. But he also got hit at Gettysburg. The famous story is called Gettysburg Milk. He gets shot off his horse. His cannonball is still in the Rutgers Library. And they say to her, well, General, you need to have some whiskey before we operate. Oh, no, no. Whiskey will never pass these lips. So they put the canteen full of milk, poured the whiskey into it, gave it to him. For the rest of his life, in his memoirs, he said, nothing was as good as the Gettysburg milk. <laughs> that was part of it. All right. Fact or fiction. Civil War veterans memorialized World War I veterans. You think they lived long enough? Fact or fiction? I'm only getting Bobby there, and he's probably right. Fact. If you go to Dover in Third Park, you see the soldier, the World War One soldier? Somebody stole the gun. Yeah, and he, each one of those stones has a veteran's name on it. And if you go, this is Alonzo B. Searing of the 11th. He was the postmaster in Dover, and his buddy over here, Charles Hopkins, from the 1st New Jersey. Hopkins was a Medal of Honor winner. He escaped from Andersonville Prison four times. They almost hung him. But he gets to Boonton, and he lives till 1935, and he and Searing get together, and they raise the money for the World War I because their grandchildren were in the World War I Army. And they named streets after him. His descendants are named Marizzini, not yeah, Hopkins. Still, Pardon me? still have the Hopkins house. Where? In Boonton? Uh, no, Dover. It's where all the, uh, the trees are. Hopkins, I didn't know that. Back there. Uh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know there was that connection, but they were friends. And over there is the Boonton Opera House, which is no more. It's on the second story there. And every year, all the Andersonville prisoners would come back to Boonton for a reunion and meet up. They suffered pretty, pretty hard. And who's from Randolph? Brundage Park? John Brundage was one of those. And he would come back. He was in Andersonville prison. Yeah, and they suffered, let me tell you. Fact or fiction, the Union Army wore only dark blue uniforms. Well, only Bobby's answering. Come on now. <laughs> I know it's late after supper. You got to get, well, we don't know. The fact is, it's fiction. If you look at these guys, 3rd New Jersey Cavalry were called Butterfly Boys. They thought by dressing them like European hussars, they'd fill the troops. Well, they're from locally here. There's a ton of them. And they're from Phillipsburg, East, and all the areas up here. Now, what happened is when they uh, brought this cavalry together, and that's a speech for another time, their general, Andrew Jackson Morrison, who was removed, was replaced by Robeson, Colonel Paul. He's buried in Belvedere right up here. And the whole point is the front of the jacket has glittering gold. The inside of the cape is bright orange, which they put backward. And 
By the way, the general said, we don't need rifles. All we need is a saber to charge at the enemy. And since this large group was mostly Germanic, all I could see was saying, uh, excuse me, <laughs> we can have a rifle maybe, you know, but they had to be under five foot six and 145 pounds to be in the cavalry. And they carried rifles. Their success was when they fought under Custer because Custer said, you put the horses over there, you guys get behind a tree. They have the lowest casualty rate. And many of them, one of these men owned what is now Waterloo Village down here and part of Stanhope, it was a farm. Uh, but the problem was the doctor was from Hackettstown <laughs> and he had memory issues. So when they went to apply for their pension, I forgot. So that all of the stuff in the National Archives are amazing. There's diaries and everything else. Now, here are the uniforms from the Zouaves. Now, I want to run into battle with red pants. You yeah. think? No, way. <laughs> no, not a good idea. Now, here's the next crowd. Um, wait, let me go back one. Did I miss one? Now, those are the Zouaves, followed by fact or fiction. The regiments on both sides were predominantly white Americans. What do you think? Fact or fiction? Uh -oh. It's fiction. <laughs> This is the officer corps of the 20th New York Volunteer, the Turner Rifles. Now, Turners are German-American gymnasts. They all go and do healthy exercise and gymnastics. And all of the Turner groups, German-speaking only, became whole units. Babe Ruth's grandfather, great-grandfather, was a Turner in Baltimore in the Civil War. Now, that's the Turners. How about this? Is, these are Tejanos. I've never heard that word before. They are descendants of Spanish Creoles and Latinos. And these are the, the Benavides brothers. They're in the Confederate Union. Look at the stars and bars here. Pay attention to the stars and bars. The bars were added to get the Brits, British Isles in. All right. These are the Spanish descendants. And if you look on the left, Stephen Vincent Benet whose son wrote John Brown's body and became a poet. This is Admiral Farragut, famous for saying, damn the torpedoes and full speed ahead. And I never knew he was of Spanish descent. And there's some more, Colonel Carlos Alvarez de la Mesa. He was at Gettysburg for the Union Army. Now, what about the Jewish people? Well, these are the Jewish generals. We have quite a few of them. This is Salomon, commander of the 82nd Illinois. It contained more than 100 Jews fighting for here. When the Confederate Union armies climbed in that battle, he was at Gettysburg with the Jewish troops, which people don't talk about too much. There's General Leopold. These are the German, the Jewish generals, mostly Germanic. This is in the Confederacy. And up there is Bernard Baruch. He's the father of the famous Bernard Baruch, the financier. And here they all are. And I just put that there so we can remember. Now, this guy is the only Native American uh, general. His name is Stanhope Uwati. He's a Cherokee Indian, and he had a Cherokee troop for the Confederates. The problem with him, after fighting there, they put a statue up for him in Texas somewhere. And they've since taken it down because nobody realized they thought he was a Southern slave owner. Uh -huh. And they, they're not a Native American, but here's the thing. He fought for the Confederacy because the Cherokees owned 1,600 black slaves. Didn't talk about that part much anymore. But anyway, so that's, this is the German Confederate, Nikolai Marshall, who designed the first Confederate flag, which is up there in the middle. The bars were added later because they wanted the British um, to come into the same war. And he was also designed the gray uniform of the Confederacy. And he was from somewhere in mid-Germany. And this is, of course, the famous Irish Brigade. Uh, they came out of New York City. They're very famous for all the battles they fought in. And Thomas Francis Meager was an Irishman teaming up the parade. So there was quite a bit of diversity. They guess somewhere north of 600 to 800,000 immigrants in the American Civil War, both sides. This gentleman was the highest ranking African-American. He was a surgeon and that's as far as he got. He became a professor of medicine. There were 186,097 black men in the Union Army 
7,122 officers and 20,000 black sailors. So we don't hear much about that either. Of course, we can't leave out the Italian group, Frank. Now, can I? You want to catch the hat? Now, only the Italians know, Frank. I can't say this. Would wear a red jacket into battle. You know, you could paint a nice target on the front. Yeah. I like the hat, though. They're from New York City. And they were very flat. I actually went to an Italian Italian uh, reenactment. Dressed funny, but that's another story. Women stayed at home. We have to look at women in the political sense today. And they were not involved with the war. Fact or fiction? Fiction. Look at this lady here. She died December 2023 as the last woman to receive a Civil War pension. How did that work? Well, her neighbor was 93, and he needed care, like assisted living, and she was about 13. And she went next door, and he said, I can't pay you, but I can marry you, so you'll get my pension of $73.13 a month, which she refused to take because her parents thought that was really kind of slutty. Yeah. And nothing had happened, but she refused the pension, and she just passed away at... Um, she was 17 when he was 93. So that's just last December. And there she is with her pension. Women married to soldiers got $6 a month and until they died. Now, in 1890, they put a pension in for them. So here are some. There were over 400 women fought in the American Civil War. And uh, they some of them had designer uniforms. You like that? Marie yeah. Tepe, she's a 114th Pennsylvania volunteer. Some went with their husband, like Katie Brownell up there, with her husband, Robert of Rhode Island. Others, now this one we're not too sore about, Sarah Wakeman. She's uh, buried as James Wakeman because she died of uh, the flu, actually. And the two women up there wearing the mustaches, I'm a little curious about that. Did they grow them or what happened? Yeah. They claim to have masquerading these are Confederates. Yeah, exactly. And not to leave the women out, these are some more of the women dressed as men who fought in the war. Frances Hook, she was known as Private Frank Miller. And this one down here, uh, Molly Bean or Melvin Bean, North Carolina. And one thing we should note, the word gay meant happy. The word homosexual did not arrive until about 30 years later. It was never in our vocabulary, and there is no word in the East or in Greek for homosexual at all. So that's them. Now, this lady was a runaway slave, Lucy Higgs Nichols, and she was an honorary member till her death because she ran to the Indiana um, troop there. And when she applied for a pension, she nursed them. She was a nurse. The, all those old boys chipped in and made sure and pressured that she got a pension until she died in 1915. It's a great story. And she's a former slave. Now, this is Kathy, what's her name, Williams. She's a black woman who fought as a man. And somehow she ended up in the Indian Wars. You have to wonder, though, how they could stay disguised for that long. But here we go. But with the Civil War raging, there were no society or balls or high society with money. Uh, fact Oh, we're getting lazy with the hands here. Fiction. The lady on the left is the most beautiful woman in Washington, D.C., uh, Kate Chase, and they all went to different balls. Note the outfits. I have a friend who has those dresses, and it takes her 45 minutes to an hour to get dressed. That's without doing her hair, <laughs> which you would do like that. I like that style up on the upper left-hand corner, don't you think? That's kind of an earmuff thing going there. Or the lady down uh, down the bottom left corner with all the hair. And they were very much into fashion, dress, and hair. This is the first lady of the Confederacy. We never hear about her. She is Marina Ann Banks Howell Davis, the wife of the Confederate. Uh, guess where she's from? New Jersey. <laughs> Born and... Um, she was born in Mississippi, but her grandfather served as New Jersey governor from 1793 to 1801, and she's married to Jesuits and Davis. This is my favorite story. This is Princess Salm Salm. I'm thinking, what is going on here? 
Her real name is Elizabeth Winona McClurk Joy. She marries this guy, Princess Felix Constantine Alexander Johann Nepomuk of Sound Sound. He was, you know, you like that? And he was a mercenary. Whenever there was a war, he put on a uniform and showed up. And uh, he was in the 69th New York. Then he went to the Mexican War, Mexican Emperor Mac Maximilian. And then he went to Europe, where he, the Franco-Prussian War, where he got killed in 1870. The princess claimed she had a, a battle flag for one of the units and that she made a bet that she could kiss Lincoln on the cheek three times, which was not a good thing with Mary Lincoln. <laughs> Mary Lincoln was incredibly jealous, screamed at other women who she thought was stealing her man. You figure Mary Lincoln's about five foot tall. A you know, people are really running after him. But she got into all the fights on that. Uh, and she, by the way, her brother's own slave. So there was quite a conflict. But this one succeeded. She kissed Lincoln on the cheek three times and lived to tell him. A fact of fiction. Was this Civil War cross-dressing? Fact? Yeah, oh, it's a fact, folks. There it is. This is Jefferson Davis, who reportedly escaped dressed as a woman. Uh, they claim that's a lie. I don't think so. They said that's a Photoshop. I'm figuring 1865 Photoshop. Uh, really? This one's a little weird. And this is yeah. General Nathaniel Lyon, who disguised himself as a woman, farm woman, to spy. And I think the beard would be a dead giveaway, but God knows what he did. But those are the two we know about. Now, Civil War cross dresses as far as the women go. These are ones who stayed as men all the way through their whole lives. The interesting, this lady was an actress. And one of the interesting things was it was illegal to cross-dress. Mm -hmm. And this is another Civil War woman who um, say disguised as a man. I don't think it was real difficult on her part, but you'll see the newspaper article here the uh, names of Mary and Molly Ball, aliens Tom Parker and Bob Morgan, attired in this city on Friday night. But that is questionable morality that they were dressed as men. Now, orphanage is an old soldier's home. And I didn't put this as a believe it or not or fact or fiction because we have the same problem today. We have soldiers, 100,000 in this country, homeless veterans, on which here, they had the men walking the streets, begging in New York City and all across the country. So what is the solution? And, and the other problem, and it's a topic for another time, what do you do with all the orphan children? They were being terribly abused, terribly stalled, you know, put to work when they shouldn't have been and dying young. So in Kearney, named after General Kearney, was the Kearney Old Soldiers Home, and which no longer stands up because all the old guys died off. But they were all over. That was the answer to, you know, honor the veterans, put them in an old soldier's home. And uh, there you see the old boys carrying their rifles. And then this is the Kearney soldier's home with a list of things that um, were done there. And these are the old guys. All those gravestones there, these old guys with these gravestones, those are military gravestones to this day. Uh, particularly, you could get them with the Civil Wars, but they give you $750 to your family for a dead soldier, even after they died naturally. There they are lining up, still in there. This is in Corny, New Jersey, right here, nowhere. And Civil War generals founded education opportunities for ex-slaves and Native Americans. Fact or fiction? Fact is correct, because this is a freedman's school right after the war. But the problem was, if you try to educate the ex-slaves in the South, you usually have the schoolhouse burned down or people beaten up. They just want to know part of it. So this man, in fact, Samuel Chapman Armstrong, was commissioned by the U.S. Army to a jail in Florida. These are the kind of Indians arrested for murder or made up charges who were sent to hard labor in Florida. Armstrong gets there and realizes that the best thing he could do was to give these men a trade, teach them how to do things. And suddenly the men were men. 
they were building, making money, and so forth. So he thought it would be great if we could educate them. So he took the 21 of the North to Hampton, Virginia, where he used them to found the Hampton University School, which is Hampton University today, the most famous graduate being Booker T. Washington. And Carl Schurz was Secretary of the Interior at that point. And I, uh, by the way, Armstrong was in charge of the 8th U.S. Colored Troops, and he became the president of Hampton Institute. Booker T. Washington said later on of Carl Schurz that because of Carl Schurz, and he said this at his funeral, if I, if I were to be able to come back again because of him, I would come back as a black man. Mm -hmm. So that's Hampton Institute, where they said they took away the... Native Americans culture. You've all heard that on the radio. We changed their name. We took their culture off. I find that not to be terribly true. One, you can see to the left the reinstatement of their particular culture. And to the right, the men in the school. There were 65 different cultures attending the school. The 473 Sioux, 194 Oneida, 112 Seneca, 61 Cherokee, and others. You couldn't sit them next to each other if their tribes were at war. So take off the tribal regalia, put them in a suit, cut their hair because they usually use beer grease in it. And yeah. yeah. And the other teach them a trade and then send them back to the reservation to restructure everything. Well, this today has become a denigration. We took their names away. Nobody took their names away. They were Billy Standing Bear. But what happens if you had six standing bears and three flying eagles? What do you do with them? You know, how do you? So they gave them a different name. Now, this man is interesting, too. He is General Oliver Otis Howard, who was at Chancellorsville and really kind of screwed up. But he was an abolitionist and pro-African-American. So his house, to this day, is the center of Howard University, black school down in Washington. Of course, his nickname, O.O. O. Howard, was Uh-O Howard. So I think he did better here than as a general. And this is Hampton, again, pictures of Hampton with the Native Americans and the little boys with General Pratt. And this is another picture of the ladies on the left are in tribal regalia. The gentlemen on the right have had been changed. The problem with the Native American schools, including Carlisle, is the movie about Jim Thorpe with Burt Lancaster, where they say they were punished and abused. Actually, the abuse happened before the Civil War. From 1802 to about 1860, all the schools were founded by religious orders. Well, they're Methodist, Presbyterian, whatever. And some of the Indian chiefs came to Carl Schurz and said, could we have government schools so we can retain our culture to that point? That gets more. Now, fact or fiction, Civil War generals did some strange and unusual things. This guy, yes. Sam, well, yeah. <laughs> General Jackson, when he fought, he put his left hand in the hair, hair because it circulated blood to his heart. And he also sucked lemons. A little strange. I have no idea why. What? He sucked lemons. It's in the middle of the battle. You know, yes, sir. Does it work? No. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. This is one of my favorite general stories at Gettysburg. Here he is. Georg Alexander Ferdinand von Schimmelfennig von der Oya. Oh. And he came. He was a German revolutionary with the other German revolutionaries in the battlefield. And when his name was presented to Lincoln as a general, Lincoln, this is a quote, Schimmelfennig, 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 I'll make him a general. <laughs> and Lincoln had a high-pitched, squeaky voice, too. But he gets to Berkeley. Now, what happens at Gettysburg? He's retreating up the hill, and he sees the Confederate army coming at him, so he runs into an alley and hides in a pig pen for three days. Oh. And then on Sunday, the people in the house thought so much of him, they invited him in for dinner. <laughs> Wondered about that. But he contracted tuberculosis in the swamps near Charleston, and Grant refused him a pension, and he died at 41 years old. This is someone else you might know, Nathan Bedford Forrest. He was a Confederate Army general, and he's the founder and first Grand Wizard of the KKK. Yeah, he was... And this is my favorite connection story. How do we connect Ben-Hur to General Wallace, Billy the Kid? I love connections like this. Wallace was a general. He's a born-again Christian, very, very direct. 
very faithful man, and there was an atheist revival going on. In other words, people going around the country saying there is no God, and he was upset. So he wrote this book, Ben-Hur, The Story of Christ, which became oh. the movie of Charlton Heston. Wow. And then he's sent out to Wyoming as a territorial governor where he's instrumental in getting Billy the Kid killed. It seems there were a lot fewer people then. Now, uh-oh. Uh -oh. You all know who he is. George Armstrong Custer. And you'll Custer. notice he's got long hair there and short hair there because his wife, Andy Custer's father, didn't like his long hair. So before he got married, he got it cut. And uh, there he is with his short hair. He was last in his class at West Point. He was a self-proclaimed publicist. He wrote books saying how wonderful I am. Uh -huh. And after Little Bighorn, he became a national hero. And then they turned it over to the Department of Interior. You were facing a tremendous amount of hatred toward the Native Americans, thanks to old George here. And his wife uh, protected his image until she died in her 90s at Appomattox when Lee and Grant signed the surrender. General Sheridan bought the table and gave it to Custer for 50 gold pieces he paid. Yeah. This is Pickett of the famed Pickett charge. He was charged with the murder of 22 Union generals. Instead of standing trial, he busted it into Canada where he ended up in a uh, mental institution. This is That's what happened to Pickett a few. How many have seen the movie Gettysburg? Oh, we're going to have to show that. That's a sleeper, though. You got to be careful. You got to do it in the afternoon. Great score. It's a wonderful movie with Martin Sheehan, uh, Tom Berenger. Uh, who else? All, a lot of good, well named actors, and it's well worth it to see it. Now, this is my man, General Daniel Edgar Sickles and his leg. What happened if you all have heard the story of Sickles? He married, he was dating a girl, and I think I have time to tell it. Yeah, he was dating a girl in Greenwich Village, a woman. The woman had an 18-year-old daughter. So instead of marrying the woman, he marries the daughter. <laughs> Takes her to Washington. Now, you can imagine he's much older. He would never admit that he's about 30 years old. When he gets there, he finds out from a, a spy that she was having an affair with the son of Francis Scott Key, who wrote the Star Spangled Banner. They had a little signal, so when he went into the, the Senate, she would pull the card down and the guy would show up. So Sickles catches on, loads his pistol, follows the guy into the park across from the White House, calls the man out, what are you doing to my wife? Well, I'm so, and he shoots him right in the chest and kills him. So he's put on trial for murder, and it's the first dream team. They get him off on temporary insanity, the first one to get temporary insanity, right? And later on, as he became a general, and he, he screwed up pretty well during the Civil War, he was quite the talker. He uh, showed the cemetery, had, in, if you go to Gettysburg today, the cemetery has a fence that comes from that park in Washington. And Sickles used to take tours and say, that's where I got away with murder. Meanwhile, when he's at Gettysburg, he catches a cannonball, which removes his leg. He sends a sergeant back to get the leg while he's smoking a cigar. And when they get the leg, it is now in the Walter Reed Hospital on display. in Washington. And every year he went back and visited his leg. And you can see him here now to carry this forth. He's the one who is responsible for Central Park in New York because he bought up all the property around it before they made it a park. And he also was sent to the ambassador of Spain, where he had an affair with Queen Isabella, one leg and all. If you ever saw a picture of Queen Isabella, you can imagine how desperate he really was. And uh, yeah, oh man, she was not a looker, folks. And he also was thrown out of the British court because he took a prostitute to meet Queen Victoria. <laughs> That's Dan Sickles. To some, he's a hero. To others, he's a total jerk. And if you watch the movie Gettysburg, you'll see what he didn't do. And this is interesting, too. This is an edict 
of Jews. I don't know if you can read it, but <laughs> the Jews were thrown out of, um, let me see, they were thrown out of three states and they were told they had 24 hours to get out. Who said this? We don't want the Jews here in uh, Tennessee, Mississippi and all that because what was happening, the Jewish peddlers were dealing with Southern uh, suppliers for the Union Army and jacking the prices up. That was the excuse. But anti-Semitism was on an incredible rise from, yes, in this country, from about 1860 up until the 1880s, it got even worse. And who was responsible for it? The British. The Genesis movement was, we need to get rid of inferior races. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. And they said, and there was a point in time, if you had a Jewish last name, you couldn't get a room in New York City in a hotel. And with that, just think about this. The wealthy Jewish people in New York contributing, like the guy who owned Macy's, Bambergers, all of those, Montefiore, all of the uh, well, Ost um, German hospital, Dr. Jacoby, the first pediatrician. These were all Jewish people. And um, there was a lot of intermarriage, too. But do you know who said that? Adolf Hitler? Donald Trump? No. General Grant. General Grant threw all the Jews out of those three states. The excuse was they were causing trouble. Thank you. You know well, have a nice time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good night, okay. Bobby. Good night, Bobby. Everybody. Good night, Bobby. We got we to go to our clock ahead. Okay. Gotcha, Bobby. Thank you. All right. So Grant throws all the Jews out there now. The longest Civil War generals are most in. Uh, funeral was seven miles long. Fact or fiction? It's a fact. Uh, General Grant, I think that was, oh, this is Sherman's uh, funeral, which was very long in New York City. And um, Carl Schertz was not involved, although the, all the Civil War generals showed up. And Carrie Johnson is a Confederate with, um, this is Grant's funeral? Mm -hmm. Yes. Grant's funeral, seven miles long, the center of New York, with two Confederate generals carrying his coffin. <laughs> the other one, this is uh, Franz Siegel's funeral. Well, that's a picture of Church speaking there. This is a picture of Franz Siegel Park today in the Bronx. This funeral went down the concourse and by the way, look at the picture of Siegel up there. You see the head on the, the figure? Every general's picture you see has that horse. They just change heads. Oh, my God. This is William Tecumseh Sherman's funeral. What's that? What were the coffins made of wood for these funerals? I have a friend who does a whole presentation on it. Uh, the coffins were often made of metal to be transported. And embalming just started in the Civil War. Lincoln was embalmed 11 times because they put him on, you know, display. Right. This funeral here is a Sherman's funeral. He lived on 75th Street in New York City. Streets are crowded with supporters. Fact or fiction? There are no Confederate veterans buried in the North. Fiction. These two guys are buried in Morristown. This is a priest, a priest in the Confederacy. Over there is Henry Harrison Walker, for some reason ended up in Morristown Cemetery. And the Johnson brothers are buried in Barryville, New York, uh, because there was a train wreck up there that killed Confederate prisoners. Now, mm -hmm. Lastly, this is just an add-on, and I am done. This is my old neighborhood in Manhattan on a very old map, and I could never understand to this day. I lived on Dongan Place, General Dongan. Near Elwood Street, General Elwood, near Sherman Avenue, Thayer Street. All of these streets were named after general Civil War generals. I have no idea why. That's just an add-on. Thanks for listening. Thanks for participating. That's important. Thank you.